now I'm gonna put a filter on this channel, and now I'll just start doing, I don't know, a bunch of like, a uh, bunch of automation. Um, so one thing I could do is just I don't know, do a bunch of filter automation. Also, what you can do now in Live 10, which is super cool, is you could just draw a bunch of automation like that, like I just did, and you can just highlight the whole thing, and you can right click and you can choose um, this option called Simplify Envelope, and it just like smooths it all out, which is cool. So we get that now. And now if we maybe go back to our first chain uh, over here and we just take all of the effects that we put on that really boring sine wave and we now apply it to this sound here, we can get something pretty crazy. So it's, it's getting adhered to the same effects chain again, which sounds like this. And you can see like each time we do it, it just gets a little tougher and a little more like pushed and you're just juicing the sound more and more and more. And to me, that's like, the, the way to do sound design in my opinion because otherwise you just I, I feel like your processor kind of gets limited because for each separate sound you want to make in the song you have to do this a ton of times and if you have all of this running in a single session then your computer just ends up getting bogged down massively so what I usually do is I'll do like a whole session like this where I just make a ton of sounds and then I'll render them all into a folder and then I'll write my song and generally when I'm making all of these sounds, I'm not really worried about rhythm or pitch or anything like that. And then I'll just find ways to contextualize it musically later. And to me, that's that's kind of the way to do that, this sound design heavy stuff. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is a concept called Mud Pies. And <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a sick name. Um, and the idea with that is see right now what we're doing is we're making like this tiny little sound that's just like and then we're just like rendering it and then go and then rendering it and doing it over and over again the problem is is you only get like one small movement and to make like a ton of movements of a ton of different sounds you would have to um do this hundreds of times right which is massively time consuming so generally what i've been doing a lot lately as well is i'll take a sound like this i'll just loop it um and then i'll kind of just do all the automation in real time so I'll just hit uh, create another audio channel and I'll just record into this audio channel. And then as I'm recording into this audio channel, I'll just be fucking with it basically and just messing around with shit. So that'll look something like this. So now all of a sudden, instead of just having like one movement, if we drag this clip right out, we have this huge clip that's just a ton of shit. And what I would call that is a mud pie, because <laughs> that's essentially what it is. Um, let's save this and call this a uh, Bisco mud pie. I saw a Bisco mud pie in the porta potty earlier. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> um, yeah, someone just like shat right in the hinge of the toilet. It's fucking gross. It's that one like right there if you want to avoid it. Um, what's that? Yeah, yeah, no worries. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so yeah, what I'll do usually then after I have this giant mud pie is I'll kind of just like cut little bits from it and I'll try and contextualize it musically. So let me um, open up a project file to kind of show you how that looks. Uh, let's go. It's a good example for this. Maybe. Uh, let's see. Oh wait, there we go. That's a good example. Uh, let me open that one. Cool, so basically the project that I'm opening now, I can show you like a ton of the sound design files and then I can show you how I sort of uh, cut them up to, to be more musical or whatever. Or actually, I think in this example, Incanti cut them up to be more musical. Does anyone know Incanti from Zebler Incanti? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
So this is a track I'm working on with him and Wolg. And um, yeah, the same idea applies. A lot of producers seem to do this these days, I find. Like most people I work with, they're generally, you know, taking these, making these giant long files of sound design and then just cutting bits out of them to contextualize it into a musical sense. Oh no, it's my Ableton crashing. Maybe. Let's give it a minute. I have faith. Ah, oh, yeah. See? Perfect. Just gotta believe. <laughs> Alright, so... Uh, what do you want to hear? I'll show you the mud pie first, and then I can show you the how it was edited to make it be musical. So... Let's see, is this the mud pie? Yes. Okay. Prepare your anuses. <laughs> this is quite the fucking noisy file. Uh, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. of just insanity and this was produced by just creating a crazy long chain of effects and then just running shit through it kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine I guess you know you like put one thing creates like a long trend whatever um, <laughs> I feel like my ideas are just like cutting off and um, yeah yeah so so the, what we ended up doing with that is just uh, cutting it up into this musical context. So here's all the edits here. Uh, and this is what it sounds like. Oh, where's the sub? Oh, there we go. Turn that on. All right. You know, this little sound here, for instance, if you asked me how I made that, I'd be like, I don't know, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> but that's kind of the beauty of it, right? It's like, you can just sort of fuck with shit and then eventually it will perhaps make a cool sound. Or like, you know, this sound. I would have no idea how to make that. It's obviously like somewhat noise related, but I wouldn't know how to recreate that perfectly. Or this sound. <laughs> How the fuck do you make that? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of the idea is like, mess around with sound design in like a more creative, discoverable type sense, where you're just kind of putting sh effects on you know, stuff and just messing around with sampling and synthesis and whatnot, and resampling obviously. And then record the output and then cut it up into a piece of music. That's also, it kind of also solves the the question of like how the hell does this person make so much music or how, how do they get so many sounds in one song or anything like that this is like a really good way to attack that I feel like because I can't imagine making each one of those sounds separately <laughs> and trying to produce the song that way it would be so annoying and cumbersome whereas this other way it's kind of fun because you just you know, messing around and, and then finding shit. And then editing is kind of fun in my opinion. So yeah, that's a that's one cool thing. Um, so that's like the main concept I wanted to show. Now I'm gonna show you like a few tricks that you could use for your own mud pies. And then we can do some questions. Uh, and then that's probably a good amount of stuff. All right. So this, um, does anybody know what an all-pass filter is? Yeah? What? Sorry, what was the answer? Wait. No, so an all-pass filter is, um, it puts certain frequency bands out of phase with each other. Uh, and it generally sounds like this. There's a few um, plugins that do it. So let me find like a kick here. Uh, let's see. 
That's a good kick. Okay. All right, so we have a kick drum. If we put an all pass filter on it, uh, so for instance, Disperser is a pretty good all pass filter, and put this on, it'll start to sound kind of wet, like that. You can hear it's kind of got this slappy, weird, I guess, like, yeah. The, the reason why it sounds that way is because the low frequencies are being put out of, frequen uh, out of phase with the high frequencies and the phase is obviously the time domain so it's just playing a set of frequencies slightly later than another set of frequencies and that's why you kind of hear the tops first and then you hear the, the bottom kind of tail out a little longer and if you put this on basses it actually sounds really fucking cool so um, let's just say you can even take a simple bass sound like a saw wave or something like that um, yeah, let's just create a saw wave with some filtering on it and just make some low notes happen here. Alright, so this is going to sound incredibly boring, but with Disperser on it, well actually let's listen to it without Disperser. Kind of shit. Then you put Disperser on it, it all of a sudden just has this kind of wompy, wet tone to it. Sounds kind of like Haywire, he, he uses it a lot, and um, yeah, and then if you also put like a ton of processing on it, like compression or something, you can really quickly and easily make a fat sine wave out of just these two plugins. Um, but if you don't want to spend $69 on Disperser, which is a really nice all-pass filter, you can also do this with the Ableton multiband compressor. And usually what I do is I just put the OTT compressor on it and I've turned the amount down to zero. And what actually happens here is you haven't bypassed the plugin, you've just turned the compression amount down to zero, but the split still happens, right? So uh, as a multiband compressor needs to compress separate bands, it needs to have some EQ splits to separate those bands. And inherently EQs always have a little bit of phase discrepancy. And the reason why is because the way an EQ works is if you want to take like three decibels of signal out of uh, 100 hertz, right? It takes three decibels, runs it back into the EQ and puts it out of phase. That's how an EQ operates. So by using something that has these splits in it and you turn the amount down to zero, and then if we duplicate it like 100 times, <laughs> it's just gonna like incur more and more phase issues and then you end up getting this. So let's, uh, let's listen to it with just one OTT on it for the moment, um, just to see how that sounds. Pretty much just sounds like a sine wave. Let's turn five more on, and let's turn another like, 10 or so on. Hear how it's starting to like in introduce this weird phase problem? Um, yeah, that's the whole trick. Put an OTT on it, turn it down to 0%, and duplicate it like 50 times if you want to incur phase problems on your sounds, which it seems like a lot of people want to do these days because it sounds interesting. That's kind of, I feel like there's a huge culture around production at the moment where people are just trying to make the most broken sounds possible. It's like, hey, let's make it sound like the sound system is breaking constantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, I like it. I'm, I fuck with it. All right, yeah. Nice, it's a wet wub. That'd actually be pretty cool with some processing. Let's put some EQ on that. Yeah, you could probably make a sick dubstep tune that way. All right, um, the next, uh, so that could be uh, something that you add to your arsenal of tricks if you're doing mud pies, you know, like if you're trying to make something sound interesting and cool. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is trying to find these like hidden artifacts in uh, time-based effects. So stuff like reverbs and delays and choruses and anything that uses uh, it time as its way of being an effect um, has this thing in it called an RT60. So for instance, uh, a reverb has an RT60, which stands for reverb times 60 decibels, I guess, because it's basically um, what uh, the RT60 is the amount of time it takes for the reverb to drop by 60 decibels. And in DSP coding, you want to code plugins so that they have the least amount of uh, strain on your CPU possible, right? So after the RT60 is kind of gone, DSP code is like, let's not really worry about making that shit sound good because no one's going to hear it anyway. Until I was like, fuck that, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna compress reverbs to the point of being able to hear that shit. And 
I actually found some pretty interesting stuff, and I'll show you what that is. Um, so here we have a reverb, just the Ableton reverb, the nicest one on the market, obviously. Um, and if we run a sound through it like this, uh, we get, hold on. It's just a saw wave with some reverb on it, it's kind of boring. Then what we should do is put a wave shaper on here. So if we get uh, Ableton Saturator, we can put a wave shaper on here. And now we get this, still not that interesting. Now let's put a limiter, still not that interesting. And let's get a utility and put that before the limiter and push 35 decibels of gain into it and duplicate it five times. It's about to get interesting. <laughs> so you get all these weird artifacts out of it that you would never have you know, thought to find. If you pitch that right down, you get this kind of stuff. Pretty sick. And then if you start messing with the reverb a ton, just fucking with the size and shit, you get even more weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool. Um, you can also do this with a chorus, which is kind of interesting. So let's try this. Get these kind of strange sounds. You also don't have to run a saw wave through it, obviously. You can run anything through it. So let's, um, let's run this kick drum through it, see how that sounds. Tight. <laughs> Tons of weird shit to find in there. Um, and also delays have this as well. Not as much, but they, they definitely do. Especially stuff like grain delays. Uh, if you do some weird stuff with that too, you can get some cool results. So you basically be like recording this as you're doing it in real time. And that's that could be a good way to get a bunch of new sounds out of a mud pie. And then generally what I'll do is like, once I have these long files, I'll edit them all down. So um, uh, let me open this file here. So I'll find these, I'll get these large files. I'll put them into a new session. I'll chop them all up like this. I don't know if, how visible that is, but these are basically just long files of like neuro bases and stuff that just sound like this. Um, oh, they're all cropped, but yeah. I'll just kind of make one shots out of it like this. And then I'll just highlight them all, right click and hit the crop button. And then once you do that, you kind of just get this folder of one shots in your crop files. So you go samples, processed, cropped, and then now I just basically have a custom sample pack here in the browser. And this is cool because like no one has these sounds, you know, so now if I make a song out of it, it's not like someone can sit there and pick shit out of it and be like, oh yeah, that's a splice sound, you're lame. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it just sounds more unique, I think, to like create everything from scratch. You know, because I think everybody has like um, pretty unique, uh, well, uh, we can go down a rabbit hole here. Uh, <laughs> um, I think like, there is a smoke machine going off for a fucking talk right now. <laughs> I feel like that's way too hype for a, <laughs> for an Ableton workshop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everybody has like unique ridges in their ears. And then also everybody has unique environmental influences. Like for instance, if you grew up near factories or something, your hearing might be a little more damaged. Or if you go to festivals all the time and never wear earplugs, your, your hearing might be more damaged than somebody else. Or if you're a surfer and you get slapped in the head all the time by waves, your hearing might not be so good. Um, and then obviously biological imperative stuff like, you know, just like I mentioned, different kind of ridges in your ears and stuff. And then obviously peer influences is a huge thing as to what you will like and what, what will sound good to you. Like what your friends like will kind of probably you know, shape what you like a lot. So all of these like three things combined will change the, the decisions that you will make in almost every aspect of music, including I think sound design. Um, and which is why I think it's important to do your own sound design because it just like you know, adds an extra layer of uniqueness to the stuff that you're doing. Um, 
That is honestly most of the stuff that I wanted to talk about. Uh, should we just do questions for a minute? Yeah. Yeah, let me show you the session that I played my set out of yesterday. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna destroy the magic so much, but like, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> it's it's really just all of my tunes in a big session, so it looks like um, it just looks like this. Uh, it's just all of my music that I would want to play in a big session, and and then I kind of like looking at it because it's just like this big grid, and I can kind of visualize the hour. Whereas on CDJs, you can only kind of see like five tracks at a time or whatever, which also has its advantages because then it makes you make quick decisions, right? You're like, oh fuck, like I don't have time to look through all this fucking colorful grid. And then I've also like color coded shit that I know will work to together. And I've also kind of like, I've got like a whole system here that makes sense to probably only me. Um, <clears throat> what's that? How? Oh, just, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like people expect like the thing on stage. I think to be like way more complicated than it is. It's just tunes. I mean, like, you know, if I just play this tune, this is all I was doing yesterday. I was just hitting like enter when I wanted to trigger the track. Like, <laughs> then that shit would play out for like you know a minute and a half, and then I'd just press enter on another clip and do some effects and shit. <laughs> 